Many, many years ago, I um, worked out at a place that had a uh, life-sized wall poster of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in a speedo uh, pointing his finger, uh, flexing his muscles, saying, no pain, no gain. Um, now, this wasn't California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. This was 25 years before that. Uh, this was seven-time Mr. Olympia Arnold Schwarzenegger pointing his finger six feet two inches tall in the Speedo saying, no pain, no gain. Without pain, getting in shape, physical shape, is almost impossible. That's just a fact. Today, I want to take talk of pain to a higher level. Without pain, it's impossible to attain our ultimate potential in our spiritual, emotional, and relational lives. Without pain, it's almost impossible to reach our potential in terms of our maturity. No pain, no gain. You might say, I don't like pain. Well, neither do I. I mean, I don't. Uh, but pain can become a great gift. It can. Some of us experience pain and we become more compassionate and wiser people. Others of us experience pain and we remain uncaring and shallow people. Why is that? Well, I believe some people have learned how to grow from life's painful experiences and some people have not. Just that simple. So how, how can we allow pain to grow us? How can we allow pain to mature us? Let's begin by, by stating three don'ts. Three don'ts when it comes to pain. Number one, don't try to run from pain. Don't run from pain. If you run from pain, it will overtake you. And one day, uh, it might even defeat you. Number two, don't curse pain. If you curse pain, uh, the pain you're feeling... That, that pain just might contain what, what you actually need. The thing you need to catapult you to new understandings in life. New, new character in your life. And number three, don't seek pain. Don't seek out pain. I, I'm just amazed at how many people go back into the situations they know are dysfunctional. The number of people who return to live in the pain instead of moving beyond pain. They just keep returning to painful, dysfunctional ways of living. Don't seek out pain. Well, if those are the don'ts, what are the do's? I'm glad you asked. Actually, that's what I'd like to talk about. <laughs> And I'd like to start here. When you're in pain, face the pain. Look the pain straight in the eye and name it. Call it by name. Complete this sentence. I am in pain because. Now that's worth writing down. That's, that's worth the price of the ticket this morning. I am in pain 
because. Can you complete that sentence? There's great power in naming your pain. I am in pain because. Are you hurting because of a broken relationship? Are you hurting because you're lonely? Because you've lost a job? Because you've lost a friend? Because you've lost a spouse? Are you hurting because someone said wounded words to you, words you can't forget? Can you name your pain. Naming the pain can begin the healing process. I am in pain because. Years ago, a woman in our church came to me hurting because she felt so alone. She began to tell me that uh, she was finding that she could not make friends. She couldn't make any close friends. So we, we, we talked for a while and tried to to talk about the the issues underlying what was going on with that. Weeks later, she came back to me and she said, I think I found the problem. And I said, really? She said, yes, I've I've found the problem. And and, uh, the problem is me. And I said, really? You can see my great counseling ability. Really? Really? (laughs) And she said, yes. She said, I've been so eager to, 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 to form relationships that when I, I meet people, I just grab onto them. And, I, and I, I'm so eager to, to have friends that I just cling, cling to them. And, and I get so demanding and that I just want to be with them. And I, and I end up dragging uh, the, uh, the energy, sucking the energy right out of them. And in the end, I drive them away. The problem is me. Now, isn't that fascinating? What a self-discovery for this 48, 9-year-old woman. The problem is me. Really? Remarkable. Some months later, we were, we were talking again when things were really going well for her. And uh, she said, I had to learn how to be alone and face the pain of my loneliness before I could learn how to be a good friend. Now, that's powerful. So often, we experience pain and we run from it. We, we, we avoid it. We try to mask it. Uh, we don't handle pain very well. I learned that lesson once when I shared a, a wound with a, a friend, hoping this friend would, would, would solve the uh, wound, would, would, would help with the wound. And in, instead, the, the friend said to me, Jim, you know, I think you need to live with this pain for a little while. And I didn't understand what he was saying then. I understand it now. He was talking about facing the pain, naming it, claiming it. One of the the master teachers in the the, the area of human growth and um, suffering and pain was the Apostle Paul. Uh, So so much of, or so many of the letters of, of Paul in the, the New Testament originate out of the chaos and the suffering and the pain of the early church and, quite honestly, the chaos and the suffering and the pain in Paul's own life. And uh, Paul was a, a person of great intellect, but Paul didn't write out of his brain. Paul wrote out of, out of his heart, out of out of, out of his passion. And uh, Paul's word teaches us uh, profound lessons about how to handle ourselves when we're afflicted, when we're in chaos, when we're, when we're in the midst of stuff that, that, doesn't, that doesn't make sense and when we're hurting, when we're at odds with ourselves, at odds with God, at odds with other, other people. And one piece of his advice, of his advice has been uh, extremely... Uh, tremendously important to me down 
uh, down through the years, throughout my life. And, and that's something he wrote uh, to those young Christians in Rome who were trying to figure out what, what following the way really meant. And uh, that's what he wrote in the eighth chapter of Romans when he said, we know that God makes all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purposes. Paul's telling us that God stands ready uh, to use anything and everything in our lives, no matter how bitter and how, or how painful, to bring about something good. No experience in our life is wasted in God's economy of, of, of things. Uh, God can take whatever happens in your life and use it to recreate you uh, into a, a person who is fuller, richer, and more mature. God has a way of taking the things, the circumstances of life, and remolding us and reshaping us. And, and where did Paul get this immense idea? Well, he got it from Jesus. From Jesus who faced his pain. Father, let this cup pass from me. Jesus who faced his pain. Not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus who faced his pain. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus who faced his pain, yet laid down his life. For the whole world. For every man and woman, boy and girl. For all of time before and all of time to come. And as a result, we have the resurrection and, and the Easter miracle. And we can live in that same way. Even when we're facing the harshest loneliness uh, the deepest pain, the most profound despair. We can rely on God to, to take our negatives and somehow, some way, uh, turn them into something, something different, something richer, something, something more positive. Dr. Arthur Caliandro, who pastored uh, for years uh, the Marble Collegiate uh, Church in New York City, tells of one morning being out uh, in New York City with uh, having breakfast with a friend and uh, the waiter approached uh, Caliandro's table and uh, looked at Caliandro and said, I know you. And uh, Caliandro uh, looked at this waiter and you know how you do those mental tricks and started going and after he'd done he realized he had no clue who this man was. But what he could tell after he'd done he could tell this guy had really been through it in life. He somehow sensed he'd had a rough life. And he didn't know anything else to do but say, so how do you know me? And the waiter said to him, I see you on television every Sunday. And then the waiter told Arthur Caliandro his story, his saga. This is what the waiter said. He said, for most of my life, I didn't believe in anything. None of that religious stuff made any sense to me. He took a deep breath, continued, until I lost my 11-year-old son. After my little boy died, I didn't know what to do. I could have done some crazy things, but I went to faith. I went to God and I became a believer. Caliandro asked the waiter, what was it that made you go to God? The waiter responded, it was the pain. It was the pain. The awful pain of this parent who had lost his 11-year-old son 
had finally taken this man to a higher level. The man didn't run from the pain. He didn't avoid the pain. He didn't take the easy way out. Instead, he did the most difficult work imaginable. And in the end, he came to God. When even the worst pain grabs us, seizes us, sometimes around the neck, we have the opportunity to go to that higher plane, that higher power. We can go to Jesus, for Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. With those words, Jesus invites all who are in pain to come to him. Then he makes this promise. I will give you rest. <laughs> rest. Jesus can make that happen when we come to him and trust in him. Healing can happen when we choose to deal with our pain instead of avoiding our pain or running from our pain or simply cursing our pain. Between 1995 and uh, 1999, I was back and forth at uh, Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, working on a, uh, a degree. Uh, I chose Drew University for a lot of different reasons. One, one of the reasons I chose Drew, because it was in uh, Madison, New Jersey, uh, 25 minutes uh, by train to uh, Manhattan. And uh, that meant that the classes that I would be taking and was, was involved with uh, involved a lot of uh, 30 to 45-year-old people uh, from a variety of backgrounds, because there's so many different cultures uh, in that area. And that was something I wanted to experience, uh, uh, a newness of being with people quite uh, unlike uh, I had, I'd had the experience to be with over the 20 years before that. And uh, actually, that was one of the things that, uh, that came to fruition in that choice, so that ended up being a good choice. Uh, one one uh, afternoon... At the beginning of a brand new semester, so a first day of class, one of my professors at Drew entered his classroom and saw the students in this brand new classroom, first day, were sitting in groups. And what I mean by that is that all the African-American students were sitting over to one side in a little, today we'd say, in a pod. <laughs> they were sitting in a group. And all of the Korean-American students were sitting over here in a little pod. And the Asian American students were sitting over here in a little group. And the Korean Americans were sitting over there in a group. And uh, then, uh, you know, you had the Japanese American students sitting over, and the Filipino American students sitting here, and the white American students, those of European descent, sitting over here in a group. And about five minutes before the first class of the first semester was about to begin, one of the Korean students shouted over, to one of the black students, why do you treat us the way you do? Now those could have been fighting words, even for 35 to 45 year olds in the doctorate of ministry program. <laughs> they still could have been fighting words. But they weren't. Instead, uh, the black student began to pour out his story to this Korean st student. He tried to explain how it felt to be a, a, a black man growing up, and he was from the city, from New York City. He tried to explain what that was like and the painfulness of that experience growing up. And when he finished, uh, the Korean student stood up and tried to explain what it was like growing up as a Korean a man in the Northeast. And he started talking about the pain of always being isolated 
and the fear that brought about and um, uh, the awful treatment that he had suffered and how he was always treated like he was an immigrant even though he was a fourth generation Korean and he, to tell you the truth, he spoke better grammar than little South Alabama white boy. Uh, uh, you know, and he talked about that fear. And when he finished, this Latino guy stood up and started talking about the pain of growing up Hispanic in this country and how every time he went into a store, two or three of the employees would follow him everywhere he went as though he was going to steal something. And even though he had an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering, everyone thought that he ought to be mowing their yard. And pretty soon it was a free-for-all. And everyone, one person after another, after another, after another, stood up and started talking about the pain, of the, the, the painful stories. Uh, and they would tell their, their, their hurts. And regular class was not held that afternoon. And a higher level kind of class started uh, being held. And people told their stories and their, 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 their examples of isolation and fear and pain. And people from different backgrounds found ways to relate. And they started touching each other. I don't mean physically and hugging. We didn't get all ooby-gooby. But, but there, there was this touching going around as though there was this osmosis and neurons firing from one brain to another brain. And, and bridges started to, 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 to psychological bridges started forming. Uh, when we feel different from other people, we can tell our stories about our lives, our, our joys, and our pains. And then we can get ourselves out of the way and we can listen to their stories, their joys, their pains, and a healing process can actually happen out of nowhere. A healing can begin. Here is the gospel truth. No pain. No gain. No cross. No resurrection. No Calvary. No empty tomb. No pain. No gain. Enormous growth awaits us if we will confront our pain, name our suffering, and rise to a higher level by asking our Lord for help. For God makes all things work together for good for those who love God and trust God to do God's work. This I believe with all my heart and soul and mind, and strength. May we pray. Most loving and giving God, who picks us up when we are hurting, who soothes and mends the broken places, we ask that we might be healed of our pain. May we be used as healer, healers for each other also. And for others in this world. So that all men and women, all people might learn to live with one another. Heal us. And bring us together, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.